Hey, what's up guys? Today, I'll show you a horror drama film. Murder Me, Monster. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins in the remote Andes Mountains in Argentina. A herd of sheep is grazing by the mountainside, a couple of them with blood smeared on their faces. They bleat and walk away, slowly revealing a woman. A red line is blossoming across her neck, and blood pours out of it. Her throat had been sliced from ear to ear. She sinks to her knees, still in shock by what happened. Her neck slowly separates from her body, but she still desperately tries to reattach it. But it's too late for the woman. When the authorities discover her body in the fields near her house, her decapitated head is missing. They immediately question her husband, who is already old and frail. He denies having any involvement in the death of his wife. He tells the police that he did see a man running to the abandoned refuge in the mountains. The police haul the husband away for questioning. One of the police officers, Cruz, is instructed by his boss to stay behind at the house and investigate. He goes to the headless body first and examines it. The woman's clothes are dirty and torn. There's a strange green goo on the stump where her head used to be. He then heads toward the nearby pen, where a sheep is lying in the dirt. Beside it is the woman's decapitated head. Back in his apartment, Cruz picks up the phone and calls his lover, Francisca. He tells her that her husband David matches the description of the man, who the victim's husband said he had seen running to the mountains. Cruz braves the snow-capped mountains to rescue the man, who is hiding in the abandoned refuge there. True enough, he finds David there, shell-shocked and staring into nothing. He handcuffs the man to the steering wheel of the car. He delivers David back to his wife Francisca. She gives him a hug and thanks Cruz for safely rescuing her husband. If it had been the military who found him, he would have been subjected to torture. That night, Francisca comforts her husband. She gently removes his shirt and touches the big wound he has along his spine. David finally talks, describing the voices he was hearing. But Francisca doesn't understand. The lights in their home flicker off, and she hurriedly goes outside to restart the generator. When she goes back inside, David is no longer sitting on the bed. He's naked and quivering on the floor, moaning loudly. She wraps him in a blanket and holds him tight. The next day, Cruz has a hormone tryst with Francisca. While they're lying in bed together, he tells her that she has already mothered David enough. It's already dark when Cruz drives her home. Along the way, they encounter David walking aimlessly on the road. He rides in the car with his wife and her lover. A few minutes later, something bumps into the car. They stop and David steps out. A convoy of motorcycle riders whizzes by them. They continue their drive and Cruz drops the husband and wife home at their house. David gets out of the car first and Francisca hurries after him, but there's no sign of him in the clearing near their house. Suddenly, a long GPS tentacle reaches out for Francisca's neck. She tries to crawl away, but it tightens its grip. Her screams of anguish echo into the night. The next morning, Cruz and other police officers find the headless body of Francisca. She is the second victim to fall prey to the unknown killer. They find David nearby, naked and looking crazy. The other policemen know about Cruz and Francisca's hormone affair, so they treat Cruz with care and promise him that they will expedite the forensics for her case. David is taken into custody. A psychiatrist interviews him about his mental issues. He confesses that despite the medication, he can still hear the voice inside his head. He tells her that the voice takes control of him and makes him violent. In the coroner's laboratory, Cruz gazes upon the lifeless body of Francisca. He traces the bruises on her legs with a pained expression. Her decapitated head still hasn't been found. The coroner pulls out the first victim's head and shows it to Cruz. He tells him that the woman had been violently raped, probably with a stick, before the killer bit off her head. The coroner also finds an animal tooth embedded into her throat. That night in his cell, David maniacally scribbles words in his little notebook. A voice keeps whispering to him, and he sobs into his pillow. Cruz obtains the recordings of David's sessions with the psychiatrist. He listens to the tapes while he's driving. David described the voice inside his head as repeating the word murder a thousand times over and over. Sometimes, the voice would also call him a monster and tells him to murder him. David added that the repetition of that phrase would always drive him mad. In the recordings, the psychiatrist probed David into why he is hearing a voice call him a monster, insinuating that maybe it's his guilt over killing his wife manifesting itself. Cruz gets so absorbed by the recordings that he almost crashes his car in a dark tunnel. The police captain calls Cruz into his office. He's concerned that his personal connection to the case is getting to him.
the captain offers him pills to manage his own issues. Then the captain lists the many fears and phobias that plague many people, driving home the point that Cruz is not alone in his fear and grief. He even shares that he also had his own great love that he lost. But Cruz is as stoic as always, and doesn't really reciprocate the captain's vulnerability and openness. After work, Cruz goes to a bar and dances in front of a mirror, weirdly swaying and gesturing in front of the mirror. Francisca had told him before, what she loved most about him was his dancing. This is Cruz's own way of grieving his dead lover. Cruz visits David later and gives him back Francisca's wedding ring. He confesses that he had killed his wife by tying a chain around her neck and attaching it to a motorbike. Cruz knows it wasn't the cause of death, so he disregards the confession. David babbles on about needing a phrase and an image. He then swallows the ring and groans. A moment later, Cruz throws up the ring from his mouth. He's flabbergasted by what happened and immediately leaves. Not long after, the police find another headless body of a woman inside a motocross track. She had been carrying a sack of walnuts. Cruz notices the same green goo on the headless stump and he takes a sample of it. That night, David escapes from police custody and is walking through the forest when he sees the gang of motorcyclists speeding down the road. He notices that he has green goo all over the front of his body. In the morning, he buries something in his backyard. Cruz listens to more recordings of David's sessions with the psychiatrist. David discussed his beliefs that the monster controls him telepathically, and the murders that are happening are an equivalence of two worlds. Meanwhile, Cruz begins to form his own theory. Based on what David said about the motorcycle gang during one of the sessions, he thinks that they may be connected to the murders since the third victim was found on a motocross track. He took a map of the area and connected all three murder sites with a line. It formed 3M, corresponding to the three-word phrase that David keeps hearing, murder me, monster. He realizes that the shapes formed are very similar to the shape of the three mountains near their town. Cruz shares his theory with the captain. He says that the next victim will appear on the other side of the river, based on the geometric shape he traced. But the captain is not ready to believe in a mythical monster yet. He thinks that Cruz is misguided and sees shapes where there's nothing. But Cruz is soon proven right. The fourth victim is found on the other side of the river. David is also found near the dump site of the body. The captain is ready to believe Cruz's theory now. Near the field, they also find Francisca's decapitated head. It was the cloth wrap thing that David had dug up. The police arrest David again, but their jeep falls down a ravine. So they take shelter in the refuge while a storm passes. The captain is intent on getting David to confess, but Cruz is fixated on the huge bite marks on the bodies. He believes that no human could make those bites, but the captain argues that David is connected to all the victims. He was seen running from the first victim's house. He was the second victim's husband, and the third victim was found after he had escaped police custody. The captain orders Cruz to get the bottle of wine under the seat in the broken jeep so he can clear his head. David is handcuffed and huddled in a corner. He offers to go out and catch the monster for the police so he can prove his innocence. In a twist, the captain comes slithering behind David and reveals that he was the monster all along. Suddenly, a long dark tentacle is sprouting from his mouth. After terrifying David to shit, the GPS tentacle disappears and a confused look appears on the captain's face. He seemed to be surprised at the green goo in his mouth. While looking for the wine, Cruz hears screams coming from the ravine. He discovers his female colleague's decapitated head below. Cruz comes back to the refuge, holding the colleague's decapitated head. The captain seems to be back to normal, alluding that what happened earlier is an example of the monster's ability to possess people. He seemed to have no recollection of what happened. Upon seeing Cruz holding the head, the captain accuses him of being the killer and handcuffs him. He says that it now makes sense why Cruz knew so much about the case and the killer's next move. Cruz calmly says that the captain is wrong and tells him to look at the colleague's head. The captain picks up the head, which was badly mauled by the killer. An animal tooth is protruding from the side of the face. Behind the captain, the tentacle is slowly slinking out of the ceiling. He gets the idea that the monster is looking for David, so he will just hand the man over to the monster, so they will be spared. The captain releases him from the handcuffs and deposits him outside the refuge. The captain moves back to the shelter and waits. A while later, a dark figure comes out of the night and walks up to David. The captain immediately responds by shooting the figure, but in doing so, he also accidentally shoots David in the head. It turns out, the dark figure isn't the monster, but another police officer. The captain drags the bodies back to the shelter. 
He immediately makes plans on how to cover up his mistakes, and Cruz readily agrees to back him up. The captain lets Cruz go, and he walks out into the night. He walks while holding a flare gun. The motorcycle gang appears again and circles him. Cruz just wordlessly stares at them until they speed away. After that, Cruz finds a cave nestled in the mountains. He crawls through the small opening and emerges into a spacious cavern. He notices a second too late that a bulbous tail has wrapped around his body. He comes face to face with a terrifying gray-skinned creature with a huge stomach and a long spiky tail. Where its mouth should be are two flaps of skin filled with rows of sharp teeth. This is the monster that has been killing and decapitating women. Cruz is shaking in fear as the monster snaps his right arm away. Unbelievably, Cruz survives the attack despite losing his hormone let go arm. He now lives in hiding in a peaceful monastery up in the mountains. He no longer works as a police officer, perhaps because of the controversies resulting from what happened that fateful night. Not much is known about what happened in the aftermath of that fateful night. The motorcycle gang's connection is not explained, nor is the captain's fate revealed, but it is clear that Cruz is now living in fear like David was. He's imprisoned by his hormone-cheating past and what the monster had punished him with. Every now and then, green goo would spill out of his mouth, indicating that the monster has infected him like it infected the captain, who might also be a hormone smith like Cruz. The psychiatrist visits Cruz later and hands him the letters that David wrote while he was in custody. Cruz reads them and profoundly empathizes with the loneliness and pain that David was feeling while he struggled with the monster that he kept hearing inside his head. Above all, he also connects with the love and longing that David felt for his disloyal wife, Francisca. After reading the letters, he burns them. The movie ends with the monster rampaging around the secluded mountains, possibly keeping hunting those hormone-cheating women. The field is littered with the bones of his victims. It opens its mouth and screams, with green goo oozing out of the orifice. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.